This episode contains adult themes and is not appropriate for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Hello, the world. This is They Will Kill, a true crime podcast. I am Courtney Eck. And I'm Sadie Eck. And it's Sadie's night, and that's all I got today. <laughs> you guys. Yeah. This is the Wells Gray Park murders. Let me have it. On August 2nd, 1982, 66-year-old George and 59-year-old Edith Bentley were getting ready for a family camping trip at the Wells Gray Park, located 300 miles northeast of Vancouver, British Columbia. Joining them would be their daughter, 41-year-old Jackie, her husband, 44-year-old Bob, and their two daughters, 13-year-old Janet and 11-year-old Karen. I'm scared. Yeah. And just to be clear, so we've got the Bentleys, which is Edith and George, and then Jackie and Bob and their kids, and their last name is Johnson, but they're they're all related. Right? Got it. George and Edith were retired and spent the majority of their time camping and hiking in the vast wilderness available to them. They had just purchased a 98 Ford Camper Special for the trip and attached their 10-foot aluminum boat to the top of the camper to bring along with them. And the camper is one of those that attaches to the back of a pickup truck. Mm-hmm. You picture it. You know, yep. Like that's, and you sleep up top of, above the car. <laughs> yep. The family planned to spend two weeks in the wilderness, hiking, fishing, and enjoying time together. A few days into their trip, on August 6th, Edith called their other daughter, Sharon, to say they were enjoying their holiday. That would be the last time anyone would hear from the family. Oh, God. On August 16th, when Bob, who worked at the Gorman Brothers Lumber Company, failed to show up that morning for his usual shift... His co-workers immediately knew something was wrong. Bob hadn't missed a single day in the 25 years he'd worked there. Mm -hmm. They knew he'd gone camping with his family and worried they were in trouble. Fearing the worst, they called the RCMP. Mm -hmm. Right away, a massive search of Wells Gray Park was launched, but no trace of the family or the vehicles were found. About a month later, on September 13th, a mushroom hunter came across a burned-out car deep in the woods of the park. Ugh. When police investigated the car, they confirmed it was the same make and model as the one that the Johnsons had driven to the park. The driver's side door was open, and in the back seat, they discovered a pile of charred bones. No. In the trunk of the car, they found more bone fragments. So the entire family is missing. Every yes. single one of them. Grandma, grandpa, mom and dad. And kids. God. Yes. Testing would later show they had found the missing family. The adults were in the back of the car and the girls had been left in the trunk. Oh, God. I have very not cool chills. Mm hmm. George and Edith were happily married for 36 years before their deaths. They had three children together their son Brian and two daughters, Jackie and her sister Sharon. They were known as being down to earth and had a deep love for their family. They were helpful to their neighbors. Everyone who knew them had a story about how the Bentleys had gone out of their way to help them. Mm. Retirement suited them. They spent most of their time in nature. A year before their murders, they had sold their home and planned to use that money to upgrade from their small camper to a large motor home. Yeah, that is my plan for the future, yes, but probably not after hearing the rest of the story. Uh -huh, I know. They didn't care for large crowds and were known to find the most secluded camping spots available. Clarence Robert, who went by Bob, was born on June 25th, 1938, with his twin sister, Elaine. Mm. They grew up in a close-knit family with their older brother, Art. Bob met Jackie Bentley, and the two were married on July 1st, 1961. Bob was the head sawyer at the sawmill where he worked. Ooh, rainy. Yeah, sorry. It's going to sound a little bit like I'm in a dryer, you guys. Um, yeah. It's just raining. He was well respected by his co-workers, and everyone who knew Bob knew his family was his top priority. Jackie was described as quiet and unassuming. She was a good mother who was always willing to help those around her, just like her parents. Mm. 
Their oldest daughter, Janet, was born on May 6th, 1969. She was an honor student in school and was known for her love of music. She was incredibly bright and easy to be around. At her funeral, her teacher said, quote, No doubt Janet only had a very bright future ahead. The injustice is impossible to comprehend. Oh my god. Janet's little sister, Karen, was born on October 22nd, 1970. I mean, these girls were incredibly close in age. Yeah. And was described as having a wonderful sense of humor. At her funeral, Karen's teacher said, quote, The tinkle of her laughter brought joy to all around her. I, as a father, would like my own daughter to be just like her. Oh, my God. An examination of the family's remains showed they had each been shot in the head with a twenty two caliber weapon. What the fuck? They were then put in a car and driven out to a remote but easily accessible area of the park where the car was then set on fire. Why would you? Why? Mm. I need to know everything. Mm. The heat was so intense and burned long enough to cremate the bodies. Wow, which is, we all know, very, very Mm -hmm. hard to do. The charred remains of all six victims fit inside one baby-sized casket. That's mind-boggling. Yes. They searched the area around the car with helicopters and sent dogs, hoping to find the Bentley's camper, but it was nowhere to be found. Twelve miles from the burned car, the RCMP found the spot they believed the family had been camping and were killed. In an area called the Old Bear Creek Prison Site, they found 22 caliber shell casings, some beer bottle caps from the brand of beer Bob was known to drink, and full bottles of beer were discovered left to cool in a nearby stream. Mm. They found two sticks with sharp ends and believed they had been used by the two girls to roast marshmallows. I just, this is, I can't, I'm too scared of this. I know. Well, and... I don't know. I had this idea in my head and it was a bad, bad idea that I was listening to a creepy episode and it was camping, two kids Uh, camping. uh, Did you listen to that one? I don't think so. It's a recent one. And I was like, oh, it was so scary. And I haven't been scared by creepy in a while. Um, And then I was like, ooh, let's find some murders about camping. And then I regret it. I really regret it. It's so scary. So scary. Police strongly suspected a local was most likely the killer, someone familiar with the area who came across a family and then decided to kill them and stole their camper. That I, uh, I will, anybody who's thinking about killing an entire family to buy a camper, just reach out. I'll Mm -hmm. finance a fucking camper for you. Seriously. I know, three generations. uh, They hoped the camper would lead them to their suspect. They even took a camper that was an exact match to the one that Edith and George owned on a cross country tour and held press conferences, hoping it would lead them to more information or to the camper. Smart. Tips did come in, but none led them to the camper or their suspect. The RCMP posted a $7,500 reward and printed 10,000 posters and sent them across North America, but nothing brought them the information they needed. Shit. During the Canada holiday weekend, the year the family went missing, the weather was beautiful and tourists were told not to head to British Columbia's parks because they were all full. The exception was Wells Gray Park, where only 18 of 105 sites were occupied. Yeah, no thank you, nope. Mm -hmm. The belief most Canadians held that camping was safe had been shattered. On October 18th, 1983... 14 months after the Johnsons and Bentleys were killed, two forest rangers came across the camper on a remote side road on Trophy Mountain, only 15 miles from the site the family was murdered, and about 20 miles from where the family's remains were found. Whoa. It looked like someone had tried to drive the camper into a gorge, but logs blocked the way, so they burned it instead. Despite lifting the vehicle out by helicopter and transporting it to the Vancouver Crime Lab, they told the public it gave them no additional evidence. What? Despite this, finding the camper in the mountains solidified their theory that whoever killed the family was a local who lived in the area. Mm -hmm. The RCMP continued to work through more than 12,000 tips that had come in about the murders. They also decided to go door to door and question the residents again. They had done this earlier in the investigation, but wanted to revisit that. Uh Uh, So they went to the small communities near Wells Gray Park. 
Uh, One resident told them that over a year ago, soon after the Bentleys and Johnsons went missing, 23-year-old David Shearing, who happened to live only three miles from the crime scene, had asked about how to re-register a Ford pickup. Oh, boy. The same kind of truck that hauled the camper. He I was going to say, there's no way that nobody noticed that somebody just showed up with a new camper in a truck. Mm-hmm. No way. And mm-hmm. it's just one of those dinky truck campers. In my mind, I was an RV again. Right. No, no. It's just the oh. one that you pop on the back of your truck bed. God. Yeah. I know there was no internet, but go on Craigslist. Mm-hmm. Two grand. I don't know. I don't 80, know. $80 in 1983. Seriously. <laughs> oh, yeah. no. Yeah, he also wanted to know how to fix a hole in the door. At the time, the RCMP hadn't released the fact that the truck had been found with a bullet hole through one of the doors. This was the tip they'd been waiting for, and it blew the case wide open. Oh, thank God. I know. Could you imagine if this was unsolved? I would, I mean. You would murder me. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You're fucking walking on thin ice as it is (laughs) with all these sort of solved lately. I know. You got to give me at least... This one's Ten fully solved. solved. Thank God. Yes. On November 19th, 1983, authorities met up with Shearing when he came to court to face possession of stolen property charges after stealing a large amount of construction tools. Mm-hmm. Shearing had a lengthy and criminal record, including assault, drinking and driving, and drug possession. He had recently been arrested for a hit and run death, but managed to beat the charges. No. Despite having no hard evidence against him, the RCMP believed Shearing was their man. They took him into custody for questioning. The detectives in charge worked hard to gain his trust and build a sort of camaraderie with him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. By doing this, Shearing agreed to answer their questions without a lawyer president. (laughs) (laughs) He had a a president lawyer? (laughs) Damn, they do things differently in Canada. (laughs) Without a lawyer president. By doing this, Shearing agreed to answer their questions without a lawyer present. Police first questioned him about the hit and run, which he admitted to quickly. He told police that he and a friend had been driving through Wells Gray Park when they ran over a drunk man lying in the road. Oh my god. I know. They did not stop to see if he was dead or alive. They then turned their attention to the Bentley Johnson murders. At first, he said he had nothing to do with them but accidentally told police he'd heard the family had been murdered by Bear Creek, which is a detail police had kept to themselves. Booyah. Every, works every time. Every Idiot. time. Little by little, he began to break down and talk. Shearing eventually admitted to killing the family. He had to have been on drugs, right? Like fucking massive quantities of drugs. Yeah, I don't know. That's the only possible explanation for that. He told detectives that he had noticed the family when they first arrived and set up as they were setting up their campsite. No. Yeah. He spent time stalking them in the surrounding woods and they never knew he was there. Okay. So he's just a fucking monster. Yes. This is a actual horror movie. Yes. Yes, it is. (laughs) After a few days, he decided to attack. He first shot the four adults with his 22 caliber rifle and then shot the girls who were sleeping in their tent. Oh, thank God they were asleep. Well, so he says. So he says. Oh, no. He then placed their bodies in the car and left. The next day, he went back to the campsite and drove the car to where it was eventually found and burned it. A few days later, he went back to the camper. He stripped it of all of its usable parts and took any other items he thought might be valuable. After learning how hard it would be to register the camper in his name, he drove it to Trophy Mountain and torched it, too. Oh, my God. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> yep, just torched it. So all for nothing. Mm-hmm. Killed an entire fucking family and then, oh, that didn't work out. Yep. He he'd said that he only killed the family to rob them. That's the... the I just... No, A, no, mm-hmm. you didn't. You did it because you fucking liked it, you mm-hmm. fucking sicko. Mm-hmm. And B... I, I yeah, and I'm stringing you along, but there's more details. <sighs> we just have to wait a minute to get them. Okay. <laughs> Not that it makes it any better. It actually makes it much, much worse. But I was going to say, yeah, none of this is none of this is good in any way. No, it really isn't. After getting a search warrant, RCMP went to the Shearing's home, which he shared with his parents, and found multiple items belonging to the Bentleys. <laughs> 
Shearing also took them to the three crime scenes and reenacted his movements on the days of the crimes. It turns out that police had interviewed Shearing just a few days after the family was discovered in their burnt car. He was one of the first people they'd interviewed. Mm -hmm. They talked to Shearing in the backyard of his farm, and police had noticed a twenty two caliber rifle hanging inside the home on the wall, but were unable to take the gun for testing without a warrant or probable cause. Right. Shearing would later turn over this rifle to police, which ended up matching the bullets and casings found at the scene of the crime. Of course. David Shearing was born in 1959 and grew up with his parents and brother in what was reportedly a, quote, respectful family. His father, who died six months before the murders, was a retired prison guard, and Shearing's brother was a sheriff. Wow. Mm Mm-hmm. No, I mean, I have a lot that I could say about that. Right. Uh, Respectful family. You know, like, sure, those are, Uh they can be, but it's also, like, highly toxic and, Uh you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh Shearing had graduated high school and went on to successfully complete a heavy mechanics course. It's just, as per usual, I couldn't really find much more about the guy. I mean, fuck him, but. Yeah, that's fine. That's, yeah, he's uh, clearly a monster. Something broke Mm -hmm. his brain or he was born bad. Mm -hmm. He's a full-blown monster Mm -hmm. he looks like a monster too (laughs) does he yeah i mean he really looks like if you were going to cast this guy to play a part for the movie that's i mean he he fits the bill it's disgusting i hate him i'm well and you think about killers nobody kills an entire family two three generations of a fucking family that doesn't happen it Mm -mm. doesn't happen no this guy is a total monster i'm gonna show i'm gonna send you his picture right now great so one of the reasons i did this case in particular because he looks so I just don't want our listeners to ever sleep or camp again. Right. Definitely not sleeping while camping. Not that combination. De- definitely not. <laughs> oh my god. He totally <laughs> Holy it's so scary. Shit. Yes, when you start watching a movie with a name like anything with road or hills in it, like the hills mm-hmm. have eyes or mm-hmm. Wolf Creek. Yeah. Wolf mm-hmm. Creek. Yes. Any, any geographical marker with an animal name in it mm-hmm. and the family shows up and they're unpacking and shit's mm-hmm. a little tense. Cause the guy comes around the fucking corner. He's like, Hey y'all. But I, yeah. Oh, ha, 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 ha. And then they get really uncomfortable and you know, mm-hmm. that guy's definitely killing all of them. Mm-hmm. That's that guy. He, mm-hmm. Ugh, and he's yep. got a bolo tie, probably, mm-hmm. as they always do. Yes. Fuck. Yes. Yep. So everybody, take a minute. Go, go Google David Shearing, Canada. And he will pop right up, and then you will never sleep again. You're welcome. That forehead really extends out. Yeah. Yep. Terrifying. So on April 16th, 1984... Sorry, David real quick. He was 23. 23 years old. Okay. They made 23-year-olds way different in the 80s. Yes. <laughs> it's like... Yes. He looks 56 years old. Yes. Doesn't yeah. he? Yeah. yeah. It's like like 19-year-olds in the 50s when they... Yeah. I'm a mother of three. Hello. <laughs> Welcome to my home. I've baked things. That's right. Like, I'm 23 years old and I look like I'm 50. Yeah. Uh, they, when I saw some brief footage of him moving, like, you know, like court footage or whatever, and he does it, he looks younger than in the still photos, but still looks much, much older than 23. Uh, yeah. He looks like he's been sitting at the end of the bar for 35 years. Yes. He's had yeah, hard f- four divorces. Yes. yes. Yeah. Yep. On April 16th, 1984, David Shearing pleaded guilty to six counts of second degree murder. Mm. As a part of the guilty plea, Shearing stated in a written statement, quote, I walked out of the bush from behind the camper and started shooting. Mm. I put the bodies in the car, four in the back seat, and two little ones in the trunk. Oh my god. I poured gasoline and it went whoomph. I stood back and watched it burn. Jesus. I went to the tent, I knelt down, and I shot the other two. He got his time line mixed up, but you get the point. Yep. Supreme Court Justice Harry McKay described the crime as, quote, a cold-blooded and senseless execution of six defenseless and innocent people, a slaughter that devastated three generations in a single bound. What a tragedy. What a waste. And for what? He then sentenced Shearing to 25 years to life. With per... Oh, it's Canada. Mm Mm-hmm. Fuck. Yep. This was the maximum possible penalty for second degree murder and the first time in Canadian history that had ever been handed out. Wow. I know. 
Wow. Yes. But unfortunately, the sentences would be served concurrently, meaning that he would be eligible for parole in 2008. Mm -hmm. So he got six of those sentences, but he can serve them all at the same time. Did he get out? No. Oh, thank God. So afterward, Shireen's mother, Rose, couldn't believe her son was guilty. Quote, I hope it was a bad mistake or a bad dream. He's always been such a good boy. He's always worked hard and he's always saw that I had everything. This is like, I'm just picturing the American beauty family. Whole, like, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? The, mili- the gay military dad. Uh-huh, and, totally. And then like the mom who just stares at the dining ca- so the China cabinet. That. Mm-hmm, yeah, totally. that's, this is, that's exactly the family I'm picturing. Yes, I think you're, that's exactly right. Sharing's brother, Greg, also couldn't believe his brother was guilty. Quote, I have a lot of questions I'd like to ask the police, too. I have a hard time believing all of this and can't say anything right now because it wouldn't be fair to Dave. Dave can go fuck himself. Mm-hmm. After Shireen's sentencing, the lead detective on the case, Sergeant Michael Eastman, made it known that he didn't believe Shireen's confession to be true, but didn't have the evidence to prove it. Really? Mm Mm-hmm. He couldn't live with Shireen's story and didn't believe he would kill six people for a few meager possessions. Before Shireen's sentencing hearing, Eastman made a deal with Shireen, who agreed to tell him the whole truth of what happened to the Bentley Johnson families after he was sentenced. Mm Mm-hmm. During their meeting, Shearing admitted it was the two young girls that had brought him to the campsite. Oh, God, you are not kidding me. No. <sighs> Take a deep breath. Yes, he wanted to sexually abuse them. Oh, my God. He first saw the family as they were setting up a camp. He then spent the next few days stalking them and plotting what to do next. At dusk, on August 10th, 1982, after the family had been camping together for over a week, Shearing says that he hid in the woods and shot Bob, Jackie, George, and Edith, quote, like a sniper. Mm. They had no idea what was happening or where the shots were coming from. Oh my god. Janet and Karen were in their tent, getting ready for bed. After killing their parents and grandparents, Shearing said he popped his head into the tent and told them a dangerous biker gang was around and that their parents had run for help. Oh my god. He told them to stay in their tent, and the girls did as they were told. Shearing then loaded the bodies of their parents and grandparents into the car and covered their bodies with a blanket. He then crawled into the tent with the girls. Unbelievably terrifyingly awful. It's so fucking awful. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but they're just a trigger warning for sexual assault against minors. Mm-hmm. Shearing said that he kept the sisters alive for nearly a week. No. Yes. Oh my God. No, I'm giving myself bad chills. Uh, he took turns raping them. They stayed with him at his farmhouse and at a small fishing cabin on the Clearwater River. <sighs> They first went to the cabin, but left after they were almost discovered. A prison guard who was supervising prisoners from a local jail came to the door of the cabin to let Shearing know they were there and not to be alarmed. Wow. Shearing hid the sisters behind the door and told them to stay quiet. The guard had no idea they were there and left. This is a horror movie. Just like a script, a plot, the whole thing, every single thing about this. Yep. Except usually at the end, somebody gets away. And not in this case. Not in this case. God. Shearing moved the girls to the farm the next day. On August 16th, he decided he was done with the youngest sister and walked 11-year-old Karen into the woods. He told her to turn around so he could pee, and then he shot her in the head. (sighs) He repeated the same process with 13-year-old Janet the next day. Oh my God. He took the girls' bodies back to their dad's car and put them in the trunk. He then drove the car to a secluded spot and burned it. He then burned the camper after learning it would be nearly impossible to get it registered in his name. Mm -hmm. So to check his story, Eastman talked to the prison guard, who remembered Shearing's account of their meeting just as he had told the detective. Eastman then went to the fishing cabin, where he found initials carved into the cabin wall DS for David Shearing and JJ for Janet Johnson. Shearing had told him the initials would be there. Mm-hmm. 
During his years in prison, Shearing changed his last name to his mother's maiden name, which is Ennis. He also managed to marry a woman named Heather in 1995. Don't do it. Don't do it. Nope. Ladies. Heather, stop. <sighs> Shearing, who was 49 years old at the time, was first up for parole in 2008. Leading up to his parole hearing, people in his small town joined with people in the victims' communities to gather names on a petition asking that he not be released. Yeah, I think. Yeah. In two months, they gathered more than 10,000 signatures. Good. During his parole hearing, Shearing apologized for what he'd done and told the panel he hit Janet after getting into the tent with the girls, and she started to cry. Quote, at that point, I lost the excitement that I had felt. I wasn't able to continue any further in the sadistic part of it. Okay. But then continued to rape them for a week. Right. And then murder them. Yeah. So, not true. <sighs> Got way more sadistic. Mm hmm He said he started having violent sexual fantasies at the age of 15. It would sometimes be so preoccupied with them that he would be on, quote, autopilot throughout the day. Uh-huh. Sharing believes it was a product of his anger at not fitting in. Mm-hmm. And I, and yeah. Yeah. Can we stop that, please? Can we figure out how to stop that? Right, exactly. You I'm don't fit kidding. in, so then you get violent sexual fantasies and end up taking it out on children? Well, yeah, and, I think it probably goes a lot deeper than that. <laughs> no, it's just because he couldn't fit in with the <laughs> group. Oh, oh Lord. <laughs> Quote, I thought it was normal for a man to think that way. Yeah, because it goes a lot deeper than that. Right. every or fucking male member of your family probably tra- treated you way. like shit and abused right. you in some way. Yeah, exactly. And beat your mom up and on and on. God knows what else. Yep. Shearing's wife of 14 years at this point. Heather, remember her? How romantic. Yep. Mm-hmm. She sat next to her husband during the hearing and spoke at the end of, on his behalf. She said the two have a, quote, wonderful marriage. Quote, I have seen so much change in this man since we met in 1993. I know the man's heart is in the right place. I'm just here to back him up. I, like, I just. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. We all have friends who date people that we don't like. Mm-hmm. And it's hard, especially for a girl like me, to keep mm-hmm. my opinions to myself. That would explode my brain. Yes. Yes, there's nothing on this planet that would make, it should make anybody ever marry a man who has murdered an entire three generations of a family and raped two girls for a week. And like, that. yeah, be his pen pal, be his fucking, you know, religious, spiritual supporter, mm-hmm. whatever, you know, help a guy get better, be a better person, be a better inmate, be a better whatever, but don't fucking make him your sexy man husband. No, no. No, you can you can find a man outside if that's what you need and that's what you want. Preferably one that has not raped and murdered murdered entire family and young children. Yeah. Yep. (sighs) Decimated three generations of one family. Mm -hmm. Just put that on your Tinder profile as preferences. (laughs) Right. These are the things I would like to avoid. Avoid likes, dislikes. Mm -hmm. God, please. Okay. Uh, so th- the parole board, most likely fucking horrified by this monster, mm-hmm. denied his parole. Thank God. They ruled he still had violent sexual fantasies and hadn't completed a sex offender treatment. At the very minimum. Minimum. He's been in the fucking prison for 25 years and he still hasn't gotten around to sex offender treatment. Like, come on, buddy. Come on. What's you been, what's like the what you're up? doing. Yeah. Yeah. After the hearing was over, cousins of Janet and Karen said the apology meant nothing. Quote, don't listen to anything he says. He has no remorse, one no. said. It was like looking at the devil. He was a waste of a body, another said. Awful. Shearing applied for parole again in 2012 and then again in 2014, but both requests were denied. He is up for parole again next month. Uh, I know, in July of 2021. Oh, no. The victim's family continues to work hard to keep him in prison and say that Shireen is in his 60s now, but still completely capable of harming others if he's let out. Oh, yeah. They firmly believe he should stay in prison for the rest of his life for what he has done. Yeah. 
And they just finished, I was looking around, and they just had a big campaign for petition signatures and whatnot, Mm -hmm. but they just had to file those. So I was like, damn it, we could all go sign petitions. (laughs) (laughs) So I, let's fucking hope he stays. Yeah, that's, I mean, I have very complicated feelings and thoughts about the whole thing, you know, right? police, the prison system. Sure. You know, I'm ma- majority against or mm. reform, uh, abolition, etc. But there are some people, man, mm. and that's what I always get hung up on. It's like I do think I've said this a million times. My my issue with a lot of kind of idealistic plans is that I know that there are some people on this planet that have currently have incurable mental disorders, right? We don't know how to, we can kind of treat them a little bit. Like they quote unquote, wink, wink can treat them is what Mm. it always feels like when I read about it, but there's no cure. And where do those people go? Well, I haven't read a lot to suggest that they've found any like really good treatment for pedophiles. That's Uh, right. Well, pedophiles, no, it's actually, that's one of the, I, I was reading recently about pedophiles and that is one disorder that they are like big fat fucking shruggy emoji they have no idea other than chemical castration which also doesn't really work Mm -hmm. which was surprising to me and also just feels like oh god that's a whole can of problems too right you know but well then you have a pedophile who's willing to also murder everybody that's like a whole nother layer of that's, problems. Yeah, that's yeah. what I mean. To just callously kill three generations of a family. Mm-hmm. I think that, you know, potentially could have not done that had he been taken care of as a child or whatever had happened to him had mm-hmm. not happened to him. But we are at that point where he did that. And mm-hmm. so... And isn't willing, at least. I mean, I don't know what he's done in the last, you know, however long it's been. But right. if you're not, t- if you're not like do like participating in treatment for the first 25 years you're in prison yeah that doesn't bode well you can really like get help and totally and you can definitely tell when you're watching a documentary or special on somebody who's done something really horrible or even something like mildly horrible you can fucking tell when they honestly earnestly regret it and are taking steps to move past it and be a better person it's unless really they're sociopaths obvious. and they're just really good at manipulating you <laughs> <laughs> i was just thinking that as i was saying it uh-huh. Uh-huh. Like, sure courtney sure you can tell <laughs> no it's so true but the thing i know about sociopaths is they're very fucking smart but they're not super motivated you know right. what i mean like mm-hmm. they don't do a lot of um they don't go out of their way necessarily. They're just like really good at getting other people to do things for them. Mm-hmm. So that would be the one distinction, but you're totally right. <laughs> but I, I would... get what you, I think there are people that really do regret their actions. I'm sure that happens all the time, but yeah, well, I think that there's people who get caught up in, you know, sort of society or, mm-hmm. you know, they were really fucking desperate people. They're really angry, sad, scared, desperate people, and they didn't have a, a lot of other options. Mm-hmm. And so they made a really terrible choice and then they grow up and then, and they find some love or support or mm-hmm. fucking confidence or whatever they were lacking. And they're like, Oh fuck that. I'm, I wish mm-hmm. that I had not done that, you know, right. had Look I had those, any like, of these things. It, make, it makes me think like Ken, Kenneth Williams, the case where exactly right. Yes. Yeah. He just, he really seemed to have figured out what he did was wrong and yeah, you know, he did, he had no support yeah. before that. Yeah. yeah. I would say 95% of the time, every, these cases are really complicated. Mm-hmm. And then <laughs> there's 5% of the time where I'm like, mm, I, I know that we currently don't have a solution for that person. And mm-hmm. this is one of those cases. Yeah. It's like, no, he's, he's fucked up. And the statistics yeah. about pedophilia are damn terrifying. Yeah. That really shit's are. terrifying that you can be, I did I, like most pedophile, most pedophilic tendencies show up in preteens and teenagers. Yes. I mean, it's like, I don't want, it's like Yikes. they're born with, it's a preference they're born with. Yeah. yeah. Like some sort of wire in the brain got crossed. And that the difference, you know, so I, I, I would think if I saw, you know, like a preteen or a teenager acting out with a younger kid, I would 
tend to think like that's some sort of experimentation or something. Mm -hmm. Um, And they say that sometimes those kids are acting out hurt, you know, Mm -hmm. majority of times they are. And so those kids are very treatable. So they are expressing what happened to them on somebody younger. Mm -hmm. They can get some help. They can fully move past it and have a good life. But kids who are hardwired to be pedophiles, Mm -hmm. yikes. Mm -hmm. Well, they've even kind of, yeah, they've put a limit to their, their like studied, like what age, like, I don't remember how many years apart, but like if a, if a 12 year old is going after a child, like five to six years younger than him, that's a big problem. Like that's not normal. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. But they've, they're trying to figure it out, but they're just sort of like, I don't know. Well, and it's so stigmatized that it's not something that can be really openly discussed and Mm -hmm. you know it's like if you are diagnosed if that's who you are you're Mm -hmm. fucked Mm -hmm. and there's not a lot of room to figure out how to not be that Mm -hmm. which is fucking tragic that'll Mm -hmm. just take you down a real dark place in your brain um so anyway there's a documentary i don't know if i finished it but uh, about a group of pedophiles that live in a motor right in like florida yeah what is it called mobile home Right. What are those called? Yep. What is it called? Yeah, mobile mobile home park. Mobile home estates. Mobile estates. (laughs) Anyway, I can keep going. So they're trying to, like, they're trying to create support for each other and also keep the children around them safe or whatever. Like, not around, but keep from, start, keep, uh, not reoffend, basically. Mm -hmm. Oh, Mm -hmm. man. Mm hmm. So. I will definitely, I've got a Google alert set up to find out what happens if he gets let out of prison. Right. Uh, There's two choices. They could let him out on day release. Uh, So it's more like a halfway house. Um, Or they could let him out fully or they could say no. Um, So let's hope they say no. Uh, Just imagine being the person who runs the halfway house. No. People land anyway i I know this whole whole thing is very (laughs) fucking dark and yeah disturbing so hey uh when you're going camping this summer you guys when you're laying in your tent at night don't think about the story i (laughs) well and it's so funny because i was a friend posted a video of one of those car top tents you know like Uh put them on top of your suv and they're really groovy and they have a little ladder and you can climb up there and i was like oh my god maybe Laura's not a huge camper. I love camping. I know you and Ryan love camping. Yeah, we do. Uh, so Laura and I don't ca- camp much because she's like, you know, very me- lukewarm about the whole thing. But I was like, oh, that would be fun. Maybe that would entice Laura out to camp. Not going to happen <laughs> this year. No. Nope. <laughs> I know. I know. Well, it's been a while. I mean, I haven't camped. I haven't camped since the boys were born. But I remember the last time. I did I just lead late at least for me I was laying in that tent thinking like I'm just laying out here in the like yeah just laying here on the ground well just and bears people people snakes whatever. ticks bitey things snaky things you could just get me if they wanted I'm just laying on the ground <laughs> well there is nothing scarier than fucking white dudes in the middle of nowhere oh no I mean maybe white teenage dudes in the middle of nowhere that might Both. be the number one scariest but yes. yeah we Sadie and I grew up surrounded by white dudes in the middle of nowhere, and that's mm-hmm. my trigger for sure. Yeah, well, people no. would come up our driveway a lot. Yeah, we get lost or whatever. We grew up really kind of out there and rural, very rural. It was so scary on a literal rural route. <laughs> rural route. Yep. Um, I hated it. They come mm-hmm. just needing to get pointed in the right direction, and it scared me every fucking time as it should because that's so scary it's so scary yeah. <laughs> i'd have like contingency plans of what would happen if i needed to escape my house mostly for tornadoes but also for scary white dudes well when laura and i were in florida we were in the middle of nowhere we picked a place in the middle like right basically in the edge of the national forest ocala national forest which is it was fucking gorgeous but um we're big bike riders and Laura wasn't feeling well and I went out and rode my bike by myself and it was fucking tingle nation. Like I am not a scared person at all. I don't get scared. I don't have hackles up kind of 
feelings very often. And I got maybe five miles out. I was like, I need to go the fuck home. Like this is, and trucks would drive by. And then I would sort of keep looking back, you know, like, like fully ready to ditch my bike and start fucking running. I was so scared that on high alert. And I hadn't felt that way in a long time. And then Laura came out with me and she was like, yeah, this is spooky. It was some culture shock shit. And then of course, you know, we started meeting the locals and they were extremely nice and lovely and whatever, but yeah, yeah, I, I mean, the reality is, as especially as women, you just don't get to go do nice things by yourself without being scared. Also, you know, you've got a big target on your back when you're a fucking white lesbian riding a bike mm-hmm. in Florida. Mm-hmm. Big time. <laughs> and, you know, you could get disappeared real fast out there just, right. you know, riding past the Trumps, the myriad Trump signs. Uh, right. I mean, one house had literally every version of fuck you plus love trump exclamation point or whatever uh, fucking right. trump is rambo trump 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 <laughs> yeah i was Ugh. playing with fire right well and you went just like a month after the, in the election and yeah, shit. yeah yeah tensions were high yeah um good, so yeah. good job court <laughs> i'm glad you came back alive but then we started making friends with all the dogs and the and the ducks in the neighbor in all the yards they would come out like do a parade for us as we rode our bikes by every day these two ducks would come running out of the house it was it was so lovely and i actually really miss it but early days it was it was totally terrifying so listen to those (laughs) tingle feelings yeah better to be safe than sorry as they say Uh, uh, And white dudes in the middle of nowhere, I would um, proceed with caution. Mm, Yeah. Or just get the fuck out. Yeah. Yeah. But then you don't know. They're just stalking you in the fucking woods for a week. A week. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's what I... A week. That's, that's bad. That's just a bad luck. That's a very, extremely bad luck. awful. Yep. Yeah. I hate everything about it. So if you get a good idea, in quotes, about finding camping murders, don't do it. It's just awful. No, that was <laughs> fully fucking terrifying. That was maybe... We've got a couple scaries, but that is mm-hmm. top five scaries for sure. Mm-hmm. Yes. Thanks a million. Sure. Have a you. great summer, everyone. Enjoy your summer activities. <laughs> Hope that they all are in cities. Yeah. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> I think they are, though. I live in the vacation community of Chicago, and it's been quiet as a mouse out here this year. Last year, it was like a fucking Black Friday at a Walmart trying to buy TVs. Like, it was so busy out here because of really? COVID. Yeah. Oh, my sense. God. It's been really quiet. It's been really quiet. And I think people are actually, A, using their city because they can, and B, going on actual vacations. I think that people are less desperate to come out to the beach, and they're, mm-hmm. like, actually going to fucking mexico or you know far away places yeah yep it's kind of a relief it's actually a huge relief went to the beach on saturday it was like 90 degrees and there were 11 of us it was glorious good yeah man i'm excited okay goodbye okay that's all um no speaking of that are you guys vaccinated are you experiencing this world this Mm -hmm. is happening Mm -hmm. i know it's crazy (sighs) I'm really, like, there's this low-grade giddiness in me at all times now. And, you know, I think we're all cautiously enjoying it because we're all a little traumatized. And so part Mm -hmm. of the process of going back out into the world is feeling hesitant to get too excited. But good God, you guys, how glorious is this to... Yeah, just go places, not, like, worry about dying or killing other people. It's we wild. It's wild. I was telling Sadie, Laura and I went to a drag show for Start of Pride on Friday, and all of our bestie gays were out, and all of our drag queens were out, and I, we couldn't stop crying, and the guy, the big burly bears we went with couldn't stop crying. We were all just <laughs> crying. It was so... I just... You just miss... It. I'm going to cry talking about it. Just like processing everything in that moment, and how much you've missed each other, and you know, I think we all really adjusted to it for the most part you know like yeah. okay well just f- not think about what i'm missing and then to get it back it's just so delicious it's so spectacular yes. i know 
we really i mean i've i've just kind of tiptoed out my children are still unfortunately not vaccinated but right like the few things that i've allowed myself to do it's like holy shit there's a world that i don't have to be afraid of yes <laughs> it's so nice it's so nice and it's... also conflicting uh I, I assume you're also having this uh, social anxiety ex- strange just, social anxiety yeah and also not i don't know you know, it's like part of me doesn't want to wear a mask now because I am vaccinated and I fully believe in the vaccination and yep. I want to like be, you know, like yeah. show people that I'm not, I I believe in my vaccination and also want to wear a mask because I also believe in masking if that makes you feel best, right. you know, makes you feel like you're safe and it protects those that are not vaccinated and on and on. So I have a lot of uh, work in an antique shop once a week and yeah. <laughs> i have I, I found myself the other day like trying to take the mask off yeah just to be like because our sign now says like if you're uh if you're vaccinated or whatever i don't know what the sign says but basically right. if you have your vaccine you don't need to wear a mask and uh so i like put it on and take it off and if somebody else is wearing it i'll put mine on and it's yeah, just exactly. a total shit show i don't know what to do so I'm no very jumbled up about it <laughs> totally it's it's a it's a uh, 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 are you uh, yeah yes yeah. definitely <laughs> been experiencing of, that a lot of people poking their heads in the shop being like i'm fully vaccinated but happy to wear a mask yeah so just let me know what you want me to do and i'm like just come in that's okay we'll figure it out together <laughs> yeah it's fully a midwestern four-way stop where nobody goes yes. all just being super polite. they're just waving yeah 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 so it would be nice to have like a i don't know like a little pin we can put on our shirt i don't know i, yeah, don't I know, know how to fix this problem but <laughs> yeah i did think about getting an all caps 72 point shirt that just says vaxxed, vaxxed. yes but yeah, I've experienced that too. And I've started forgetting my mask, which has not happened in a long time. Like mm-hmm. I I have them in my car, in my purse, and then, and then, and then all of a sudden I'm finding myself in places. And I'm like, how the fuck do I not have five masks on me right now? Yeah, I know. I went to my first indoor restaurant with Ryan over the weekend and uh, he forgot his mask. And so we, we did totally what the people do at the antique shop. We poked our heads in to see this, what's yeah. happening. Yeah. <laughs> and um and none of the workers had masks on, so we were like, right. "Okay, all right, we're not it's gonna... cool." Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I was like, totally "Otherwise, disrespectful can... if you don't wear a mask in, even though it's always been the silliest rule to like yeah. wear a mask to your table." Great, right. but still, it's like a respect thing. I, I get to- it totally. Yep, yep. So, how are you guys wearing your masks? Are you? Are you getting your vaccine? Please go get your vaccine. Yeah. I would like it if you did it. Please. I think most people are doing it, and I appreciate I it. This is awesome. It's awesome. I really mm-hmm. miss this world, and I'm grateful for all the things I learned in the COVID, and I'm not grateful for all the horrifying trauma and fucking death, death. and unnecessary, yeah. unnecessary pain and fucking illness and et cetera. Yeah. So. Yep. Let's stop it. Let's end yes. it. Let's take our lessons and move the fuck on and let yep. people be healthy and not die. Right. Yay. Yay. Let's do it. You guys. Um, got any names? This yes. Week? I also, I uh, got, I've got a couple of vocabulary words for us that are name related. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. Aptron, aptronym is a name that fits the person uh, with that name, like Usain Bolt or Anthony <laughs> Weiner. <laughs> Aptronym. Aptronym. <laughs> um, and then inaptronym is a name that doesn't fit the person. And that made me think of Yvonne Curlis, who was the oh, woman right. who checked me in for my vaccine, who had the curliest, curliest. hair I've ever yes. seen in my life. So, uh, fucking really appreciated that. Thank you, TikTok, for that information. Shit, yeah. Um, <laughs> our darling angel Aaron, our first patron <laughs> yes. and Texas um, jock angel, sent us bum farto, <laughs> which was a fucking fire chief in Florida who was dealing weed out of the station and disappeared. Oh, where did bum farto go? Where's bum farto? <laughs> I hope he's okay. <laughs> I, uh, most of the names this week sound to me like a cartoon western. <laughs> so like Smokey Huff. <laughs> Definitely the fire chief of the western cartoon. <laughs> Tequila Don Redford. <laughs> Mike Biggerstaff. 
Janine Brabender. She's the wise cracking, <laughs> smart talking, gun toting lady of the group, of the gang. Um, Christian Surface. <laughs> mm. He's surface. the man that comes from the future and right. is somehow a member of the gang. Totally. And then Jewel Fields. She's the hot one that sits on the piano. <laughs> right? Totally. <laughs> um, and there's also two dentists in one town. One is named L. Scott Seaman. <laughs> DDS. You guys know I fucking love uh-huh. a DDS. Dr. Seaman. <laughs> Dr. Seaman. And then Dr. Leslie D. Seaman. DDS. Are they related? Probably. I'm going to assume so. Yeah. One of them. I, what, what would be the odds of having two separate dentists, semen dentists? <laughs> Remember when you and I were at that Mexican restaurant and we both put our credit cards down and the gay waiter said, yeah. oh my God, are you guys married? <laughs> and this was in like 2001, like maybe even 2000. Well, if you would... haven't heard it. <laughs> and we said, no, we're, we're sisters. sisters. <laughs> so sweet. He was like, uh, I almost didn't oh, want to yeah. burst his bubble. The other reason that people have the same last name, they're fucking related. Um, so cute. It was so, so cute. cute. <laughs> Phew. Anything else? Yeah, I got some shouty outies. Woohoo! Oh, boy. Let's see. So, thank you so much to Khadija B. Yeah, Khadija! I have a good friend from way back named Khadija. She's attractive, very smart, fucking sweet as a damn piece of pie. Mm-hmm. Gorgeous. Yes. Everything. Thank yep. you, Khadija. Thank you so much to Liza T. Oh, come on. I love the name Liza. I do too. That means you are sassy. You probably know how to sing well. And don't take no shit from nobody. Yeah. Uh, no. Lots of finger, finger waggling and a mm-hmm. sassy way that's also somehow charming that's right and smart i think liza's are smart for sure and last but not least thank you so much to kieran i i feel like khadija liza and kieran kieran well k-i-r-a-n oh kieran kieran regardless speaking of gangs those three are definitely in a fucking cool ass gang (laughs) yes they are right palling around palling around cool and each of them has their own distinctive style and sort of attitude, mm-hmm. and they're each one mm-hmm. as cool and interesting as the other. Thank you, yeah. guys. I love you guys. I love you guys, too. And if you want to spend more time with us, which we highly recommend, come find us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at They Will Kill. Go to our website, theywillkill.com, and you can always email us, always, at They Will Kill podcast at gmail.com so yeah you can also go hang out at on patreon oh we, yeah we have a ton of interaction on patreon shit, yeah we do oh, and there's like 48 episodes now or something ridiculous yeah whole ass full ass episodes guys. i don't know how enough time has passed to have done enough all of these episodes it's really it, it is a time warp for me i was thinking about that today mm-hmm. it's a fucking time warp mm-hmm. it's it's astrophysics yep yeah bumped into some people i know the other day yeah. And their children were like fucking giants. Dude. And I was like, how is that possible? And I was like, oh my God, mm. I, no, I've lost a whole year of my life. That's how that happens. You just, no. everybody else keeps moving on too. <laughs> I've reached that stage of life where the it. kids are going to college, Yale. I know, man. They are going to Yale, Stanford. Uh, excuse me? Mm-hmm. Uh-uh. That's yeah. weird. So anyway, go to the time warp zones of our Patreon. Yes, please. Go right You'd on. You'd be amazed there. at how much time has passed. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, uh, please also rate, review, subscribe. We have a lot of tasks for you today. Yeah. Check it off the list. Put it on the honeydew list. Just yes. stick it on your fridge. <laughs> thank you, Take- AJ Bergans. Hey, write thank you no, write AJ Bergans a thank you note for his music. Yep. Thank you, AJ. Put, put it on the, the list. Put it in the mail box. Uh-huh. <laughs> It'll get to him. <laughs> And remember, um, you know what I was wondering the other day? Tell if, me. Was the gap ever good? Yes, in like 2005. It, was it though? Yes. Does any, can anyone confirm this? I'm confirming it for you. <laughs> like high quality fit well? Yeah. I don't know about quality, but people fucking loved it. And they were, I think it was like hot shit when layering of the tank tops was what you did. 
Well, I just want to know if it was good, though. Like, if it was as good. I, I don't want to get everyone like swell. Banana well, Republic. <laughs> Standards so I think that was also high. high quality in 2005. Well, I think that's what I'm referring to. I mean, Old Navy owns basically all of them. I think they own Old they own Gap and Banana Republic. So yeah. no, the answer is now no. Don't go there. It's terrible. No, but I, I still go to the Gap every once in a while. Like, oh, I need some basic white T-shirts. I'll go to the Gap. But I go in there and they just like disintegrate in my hands. Yeah, and I'm like. I feel like the gap was good, especially in the nineties. Like it was very hot. And I work one of my companies we work with is J Crew and Mickey was the CEO of J Crew that basically tanked them into the ocean. Um but previously <laughs> he was the CEO of Gap and he got famous because he made the gap cool with the like the shirts that said gap and the white mm-hmm. fucking button ups and whatever. But I'm questioning if it was ever actually good. I think that's a much. I need to go watch some fucking Netflix special on fast fashion to probably get my answer. But yeah, I feel like it was good. Was it I good? Think, I think it was. I I was thinking the boys, not right now, but as babies, they had some Gap baby clothes, and they were all like solid quality. Well, I think baby clothes they're so little that you can't. You know, they're just yeah. like the you stitching like is so tight. The... <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. it's all sort of doubled up and stitched real good. Well, so some baby clothes can used to be especially used to be very itchy like i get some yeah. like hand me downs yeah it's just like i'm not putting this piece of sandpaper on my baby it's because that surger stitching you have to surger all baby clothes so that yeah. they don't rip to shreds but surger stitches are itchy ouch <laughs> anyway anyway hope you guys aren't itching with surger clothes yeah. and enjoy your camping trips think just think about the gap that's important yeah. And we and we love you. We love you. Uh, enjoy the world if you're vaccinated. If you're not, oh, go get vaccinated. Please. If you're in a tent, like put a metal cage around you. Oh god. And we'll talk to you next week. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. 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 Goodbye.